pleasure of meeting Dr. Posado over the past couple of days. Uh, he has a really interesting uh, opportunity in front of him uh, to really work on the uh, information systems in cars and to actually implement the decisions that, that uh, this group makes. Also, uh, uh, as it, I, I don't know if he'll have some time, but he has a very interesting background in how he got into the car industry, uh, which was uh, really uh, uh, at, at a midpoint in his life. So, uh, I'm trying to get something in my ear. Okay. Um, uh, this is just also, uh, it's a large auditorium if you guys want to move down and uh, not forcing or anything, but you know, just trying to get a, a conversation going. As, as we're getting set up here, you know, I, I, find, I find it interesting that, um, you know, there's this uh, debate about government uh, that we're all seeing in society. And one, one idea is that the government should just uh, figure out what the solutions are and help us. Yes. And another is that the government should set objectives and let, and let private industry, you know, figure out what these solutions are. And what we just saw with this uh, with this presentation was just a you know huge range of, of issues you know safety mobility environment um, uh, applied against all of society but uh, how they actually get implemented the actual technological choices um, who makes those and how they get tried out these are all open open issues which I think you know we're we're at a point in the Automotive industry, we're ready to re-examine some of how our methods and how we make these choices. Yeah. So let's keep that in mind as we turn the documents on. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. And okay. certainly enjoyed uh, Dr. Bertini's talk, and it's, uh, it's interesting. We have heard much of this in various forms before, but every time you hear this, there's always a new learning and a new insight. So that's pretty good for me. Um, I'm here really um, to share a, a slightly different. I'd say a complementary, but a different perspective from what I would normally give uh, when I wear my, my Ford badge on and speak on behalf of, of the automaker, well, the auto, large automaker's Ford. I'm, I'm here to sort of uh, speak about a, a, uh, what I think is a pretty interesting and exciting uh, vision that we have here as a, as a community uh, that seems to be gaining some interest. And, and, the, and, the, and the sort of umbrella term we're using for that is Detroit. 2.0, and it's really about all of us, and it's about all of us connecting in, in interesting ways. So first of all, um, why Detroit, and 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 uh, why now? Uh, clearly, uh, one can go back to history, and one can just look around. But let, let's first look around and look at all the enormous capacity we had here, the capacity, the physical capacity, the capacity for for um, intellectual creativity, the capacity for the young and old to come together, uh, the phenomenal amount of of space we have here in terms of proving grounds, labs, uh, the amounts of tools we have around here, all kinds of tools, um, and, and talent, therefore, um, all waiting to get wired and reconnected, if you will. Um, and, 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 and so that's in part why it's all about Detroit. It's also, of course, as you reflect on history, you go back 100 years and, and uh, Detroit provided to the world that, uh, that essentially um, uh, technologies and tools that, that transform the world in many ways. Uh, where else um, on the planet, maybe there's one or two other places, uh, where you have 100 years of talent, uh, talent that can machine high precision mechanical things that can revolve at uh, 2,000 or 3,000 revolutions per minute and, and be um, uh, a, a consumer product enduring 10 years and 150,000 miles of usage for everyone from a 16-year-old to a 86-year-old, everyone licensed. Uh, there's not too many places in the world. And so it's really about the talent that we have here. It's about the talent to make high-precision mechanical things that move, uh, that can be essentially brought together and interesting in different ways today. Uh, and so that's why it's about Detroit. Uh, why why 2.0? Uh, I'm not sure if that is necessarily uh, completely understood with the term 2.0. Uh, some of us might think that this is the second edition of Detroit, uh, waiting for a third edition to happen. But really, I'm, I'm using the word 2.0 um, in the context of, of what uh, Dale Doherty had used this when he coined that term, um, along with, with others, um, um, Tim O'Reilly and, and many other thinkers here, uh, who are here with, with us, amongst us today. And really, the notion was about people. It's about people coming together 
to create value ideas um, and, and really bring solutions together by unusual networking at the grassroots level. It was about developing multiplicated value in, in intellectual capacity by people coming together. It was about influence, not because of a hierarchy, a top-down hierarchy where a CEO brings together his or her span of influence, but it was because at the grassroots, people got famous and got influential because they did really interesting things in many different ways. And it's also about how the cost of failure was immensely reduced. So you could go to SourceForge, it's one of the sites where, where open source code is, is, uh, is uh, presented, and you could have a thousand different ideas presented there, 9,900, I should say 999 of which might not be useful at all, might be useless. And then one idea would create a Firefox, or create a Google, or create Linux, or create something else. And so that's what this is all about. That's what the 2.0 revolution is about. Uh, what do we see to you? So that's, that's the 2.0 aspect of, of Detroit 2.0. And of course, what's our collective vision as we bring Detroit and 2.0 together? It's really a vision about making Detroit a cradle, once again, for innovation and for a new industrial revolution. It's about really seeding all of us and connecting us together in very unusual ways, in ways that, that the old technologies, the 1.0 technologies, may not have enabled. And we're not saying that 1.0 is gone, but we're saying that there's an opportunity for this new ecosystem to thrive and exist. And this is what we're beginning to refer to now as not the Detroit 3 or the Big 3 or the Big 6 or the Big 9 anymore. Those exist in their own context, no doubt. There's a great value proposition there. But what we're referring to as the small millions. How many of us, individuals, small teams, groups, young and old, teachers, students, can come together to create value, to define, refine, and shape our experiences of the future. Experiences that build upon things that you make at the end of the day. All of us here are here as makers or people interested in making things. Second of all, it's about really creating novel ways to link the makers to the takers. And this is where you can go back 107 years or two uh, or so to the history of Henry Ford or to, to great entrepreneurs who were here. All the great open garages that were amongst us in 107, 110 years ago that allowed us to tinker, to innovate, to become makers, and to create products that millions of people could buy. That millions of people could then drive around with and create new ecosystems that generated the interstate system, that generated the created value through private entrepreneurship in the form of motels and, and the emergence of Holiday Inn. If you walk around the Henry Ford Museum, you see a big neon sign that shows the Holiday Inn, and you wonder why Holiday Inn. But the Holiday Inn came into existence because you had cars going around. And you had cars going around because you had millions of takers. So those were the takers of 100 years ago. And what we hear about today and what Detroit 2.0 is about matching the new makers to, the, to a new generation of takers. And that's what the, the 2.0 sort of vision is, if you will, the Detroit 2.0 vision. So you could say, well, what's the, this is, it's, it's a nice vision to have, but what's the framework? Is there something that you can sort of put in, in context and start doing something? What are the sort of, uh, major roadblocks and what are the necessary tools that we need. Clearly one thing is, is, um, is a shared space. So it's really about creating and recreating and, and opening new garages, whether it's your own private garage or whether it's a, a virtual garage somewhere. And so what we're trying to do is, is clearly get space together. And as, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're really trying to look at, look at capacity for us at Detroit and look at how to connect that capacity uh, to the tools of today and the networks of today, if you will. So the first aspect within this framework is really getting space together. The second, piece is, is a second, a second aspect within the framework is really getting tools and toolkits together. So there are all kinds of toolkits available today, and it's a question of perhaps repurposing a toolkit, a toolkit that makes you do your job uh, at, a, at a relatively low uh, point of entry, so you can make your thousands of mistakes, or your, or your 999 mistakes, to get that one spark of a perfect light bulb, or a perfect tool, or a perfect uh, machine. And so that needs to be done with a very, very low cost of failure, both at the individual level and at the level of a collective grouping, if you will. So this is not 
This try 2.0 is not about going and buying your own machine tool for, for a million and a half dollars and then getting uh, uh, people together, uh, an organization together to use that tool to produce millions of parts. That's being done today and there's all kinds of efficiencies in terms of how that's being done and where that's being done. But this is about really having tools that, that people can access. The third piece, of course, is ideas. And how do you allow the free flow of ideas and free exchange of ideas, if you will, but obviously at, at, at market uh, determined prices, if you will. So what you want to do is to create the, the exchange and remove the barriers that prevent ideas from flowing across. The conventional thinking is that large organizations get together, get the brightest into the organizations, and then get them to create ideas. And then you build barriers, walls around those ideas, and then in a very selective manner you license those ideas at a, at a sufficiently large barrier that it completely leaves out the millions of the small millions. And it creates the big three or the big two or the big one or the big nine or the big twelve. This is about really saying how do you remove those barriers for the flow of intellectual property. So you can place your idea in some kind of an eBay, if you will, and the world can value it. And if someone wants to pay $10 million, they get that. But if the world thinks it's worth, it's worth nothing, then it's nothing. So it's really creating that exchange for ideas. So these are the sort of three major elements of the framework, the spaces, the tools, and then removing the barriers for intellectual flow, if you will. So, so having said all this, having said what Detroit, why, why we're talking about Detroit, why we're looking at what 2.0 is, and, and why Detroit 2.0, and then what the framework for operation is, uh, you might wonder, is this still talk? Are uh, we doing something about this? And I was, uh, I'm, I'm really excited and very glad to, to state that just yesterday we announced that Ford and uh, Tech Shop, which is one of the most innovative concepts around, um, have announced a coming together. And, and if you haven't heard of Tech Shop, I believe they have an exhibit up here. Uh, Tech Shop is a very really innovative notion by which you can pay $100 uh, or $150 a month and you have uh, essentially unlimited access to tools. So that's an example of how the barrier for you and your creative idea to take uh, fruition is, is reduced by essentially leasing space here. Uh, Tech Shop also allows this kind of free flow of, of, uh, of people, of talent to come together. Uh, interested makers who come and meet skilled and experienced makers who might be able to give um, advice and, and mentor these, uh, these uh, interested makers. Uh, there's the young and old who can come together and, and, and therefore Tech Shop becomes sort of a, a mechanism to be able to provide the, the uh, low cost capital, if you will, uh, for you as a maker to go out and create things. The third aspect has to do with intellectual property. And in that context also, uh, Ford just made an announcement uh, yesterday uh, to create arguably the world's first innovation exchange. It's like a mercantile exchange. It's like a stock exchange. It's called the Innovation Exchange. And this Innovation Exchange begins right here. Uh, the actual dates will be announced very soon, but we have that where we will place IP, others are welcome to place their ideas in, People are, are open to come and look at, at what the idea might be worth to really create, refine the idea collectively, and then go on and, and, and create capital, which at the end of the day, all of us, whether young or old, small or big, uh, need to sort of create and fuel innovation and fuel this next generation of, of if you will, industrial uh, revolution. Uh, just sort of, I've sort of spoken about at least five different <coughs> notions, uh, Detroit, 2.0, Detroit 2.0's vision, the framework, and then of course uh, a concrete example of what we're doing. I'll sort of end with a, with, a, uh, with what seems to be uh, certainly getting the attention of, of kids today. I have a 15 year old daughter who relates to anything Facebook and relates to not much else. And so just, just imagine this, uh, you have a Facebook app, and again this has nothing to do with Facebook per se, but it's just that people relate to this. Uh, and, and there's a kid sitting in, in Kalispell, uh, maybe Bozeman, Montana, or somewhere else, you know, could be Palo Alto, California, and this kid now creates, uh, sort of wants to have a little backpack holder in the, in the back seat of, uh, of her car. Um, and she comes in and creates, uh, uses a digital play, that's sort of a Facebook app running there, and creates a really cool little uh, uh, backpack carrier, and submits it to, um, essentially hits the print button there. 
that trigger happens to sit in tech shop right here in Detroit. And that tech shop then has her, uh, someone there who's a maker, who's in her social network, who comes and sort of creates the actual physical part. And then there's a mentor sitting out here who's got many years of experience in wear and tear and durability, having all the automotive experience, who comes and says, well, yeah, this is not going to work. We need, really need to modify this in some other way. And this might not face the durability tests of, of uh, hot and cold weather and rain and sunshine. And some modification is made there to that part. And maybe it's even placed in a brewing ground along with lots of other moving parts. And a day later, it comes back refined and sort of ruggedized. And it's placed back into cyberspace. And this kid in, in Bozeman, Montana, or Palo Alto, California, gets a refined version of that. She or he can then modify that in various ways, add color to it, add some zinc to it, and then submit it to wherever it needs to go. Maybe it's Target, maybe it's somewhere else, and those guys figure out whether they want to make a million or not. But nevertheless, there's at least tens of, tens of those available, or 20 of those available, that all seem to work on you know, cars. That's pretty neat. It's, I'm just giving an example, and all this could happen through a Facebook interface, or whatever uh, interface is most appealing to the next generation, if you will. And so what I'm trying to say is that these are very interesting ways to connect capacity here to virtual tools and tangible tools and to the makers no matter where they might be. So that's really, I think, what the excitement about Detroit 2.0 is all about. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to continuing to explore this and work with all of you to, to make, uh, make aspects of this uh, a reality. Thank you all. I'm certainly glad to take questions now. We could discuss things offline too. By the way, is uh, John uh, Carter here? John Cochran? Okay. Uh, so our third speaker hasn't sh shown up yet. Uh, but I, are there any. Okay. Hey, there. Okay, we have our third speaker. Uh, so I, I do want to have a session at the end where we can all have all three gentlemen up there, but is, are there any specific questions for uh, Dr. Prasad? I think, uh, I think this, uh, you know, one of the things that, I, that I've really come to appreciate about Dr. Prasad is he's an outsider to the auto industry and he really brings a, uh, a clean approach to it and uh, the sort of intersection with the way innovation happens in other sectors uh, has uh, a, lot of, a lot of potential, I believe, for the auto industry as well here in Detroit. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you.